Good evening, everyone. My name is John Highbush. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. I want to welcome all of you here this evening in honor of our men and women who protect our freedoms around the world. If you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks very much. Please be seated. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize a few people in the audience that have joined us, and I would certainly like to start with uh, Ken Starr's wife, Alice. Alice, great to have you here. Now, from the Board of Trustees of the Reagan Foundation, and apparently there is a, an accident in traffic on Route 101, and he's on his way here, though, but Governor Pete Wilson and his terrific wife, Gail, they'll be here in just a few minutes. And I absolutely have to say hello and ask you to welcome our former Congressman Elton Gallagher and his wife, Janice. Now, we have with us this evening a man who is, by any definition, one of the most consequential, most controversial, most famous, and certainly most successful jurist in memory. Now, that is quite a statement. But if you have followed Ken Starr's remarkable career, you know that he has served at one time or another with titles that define a talented lawyer and brilliant legal mind. Let me recite just a few. Clerk for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Clerk for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Counselor to the U.S. Attorney General. Here's a particularly relevant title to this audience and library, judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, as nominated by President Ronald Reagan, U.S. Solicitor General, Dean of the Pepperdine School of Law, Professor, Chancellor, and College President, and as of late, of counsel to the Lanier Law Firm in Houston, Texas. Now, even casual observers would note that I have withheld one title from that impressive list. It's a title involving one of the most controversial legal matters to come before the American people as we brought the 20th century to a close. Now, some would say his role in the position was notorious. Some would say no, that of all his positions, it was his most glorious. It's a title that over the years has come to be known interchangeably as that of independent counsel or special prosecutor or special counsel or independent prosecutor. Call it what you want. The role first assigned was to conduct the Vince Foster and Whitewater Development Corporation investigations but that famously led to what we now remember as the Lewinsky affair, which in turn led to the impeachment and trial of the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Now, as I've said, one might call, <laughs> one might call the job that Ken Starr held for almost five brutal, challenging, and life-changing years that of independent counsel. But I would call it something else, and I have no doubt that Ken would agree. Indeed, I think it's the most prestigious title he's ever held, and it is that of public servant. Ken Starr gave some of the best years of his life 
to his country as a public servant in the role of independent counsel. He held that title because Congress enacted a law relinquishing its own authority to investigate wrongdoing in the executive branch, and then the Justice Department abrogated its authority to do the same. In the process, as that public servant, he earned the contempt of about half of the country. Fortunately, because of his professionalism and his patriotism, he also earned the thanks and admiration, no doubt, shared by this audience tonight, of the other half as well. His newest book, about 20 years in the making, is just outstanding. It's appropriately titled Contempt, and it is precisely what it claims to be, a memoir of the Clinton investigation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would please join me in a conversation at the Reagan Library with Mr. Ken Starr. That was outstanding. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Judge, thank you for being with us. Thank you. The honor is, uh, is ours. Uh, we love this library. It's, uh, so thank you for the honor of being here. Absolutely. Um, I divided my really smart questions into a few sections. The first. Do I need my lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot of Pepperdine lawyers in the audience. So. But the first set of questions involves the book, and then we'll move on to perhaps a few other contemporary topics. On the book, I read, I think in the piece you did for the Wall Street Journal, um, that once the 2016 election was over, President Trump, uh, and by most accounts, surprisingly elected, Hillary Clinton not. Uh, and I, I read that you'd made the decision, you know, it seems now, therefore, the Clinton era is over and it's time to write this book. Um, I take that. If Clinton had won, do you think you still would have written the book? It would have been a harder decision because uh, I want my presidency, whether I voted for them or not, to succeed. And I would not have been eager to be the skunk at the garden party. Uh, but she did not win the election, and that was simply one factor. It was a large factor, but it was only one factor. Uh, but we were coming up on 20 years, uh, and so here we are. It was this fall, 20 years ago, that these events unfolded, that Congressman Gallagher was such an integral part in his service on the House Judiciary uh, Committee. And my view was it was sort of now or never, moreover, uh, as Alice reminds me, uh, 20 years is a long time, so think about folks who've in college now. They either weren't alive or they were too young, and so uh, it seemed important to share a perspective. It is a memoir, uh, but it's more than just, well, I remember this and I remember that. It really is trying to tell the country, this is what really happened outside the public record, including, just by way of one example, our serious consideration of the indictment of Hillary Rodham Clinton. We tell that story. Uh, and it was an important story, I, I thought, to tell, because there was a lot missing in, those la in the narrative that we've heard about those last years of the 20th, and uh, 20th century. Yeah. Um, you write in your book towards the beginning, um, about the process to place what you were doing when Judge Sentel gave you that call. I was minding my own business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I remember reading that you, uh, you really, you felt, uh, it's not as though you've been spending your life preparing for just that moment, but that you felt it was a, a natural thing to do, a public service, a public duty. Right. And I wonder, if you'd had a crystal ball at the time, when, after the judge called you and you thought about it for a day or so, 
Um, and you knew that the trial, the travails would be as grueling and as difficult as all those were, would you still have made the decision to move forward and take the role? I think I would have, but hopefully I would be a lot wiser. I would have been wiser, a lot uh, smarter. One learns from one's mistakes, just life experiences. But yeah, I think we're called, I mean, we're, here we are uh, in the spirit of Ronald Reagan. Uh, the ideals that he set out for public service that are exemplified by so many people here in the room, whether they served in uniform or in a civilian capacity or simply being great citizens and loving their country, I felt the duty to <clears throat> respond to the call. But I sure didn't apply for the job. No, no. Now, this next question, it's not fair to ask you, so... Uh, well, then don't ask him. No, I got it. <laughs> He's ruled himself out of order because I know him to be a fair person, so... Um, Fire away. Well, I just, I have the view, given your credentials, um, if you had not taken that job, I think there's a very strong chance that you would be sitting as a justice on the Supreme Court today. Do you have to remind me of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, would, I don't know if you can agree or disagree with that, but because uh, obviously a lot of things have to come into play, but from right. a qualifications perspective, you certainly were there. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> there's so many imponderables. Uh, I don't know, but I would imagine that I would have been under consideration by President Bush 43. Um, I was uh, and am very close to the Bush uh, family. Uh, I had the great privilege of serving in the Reagan administration, as you mentioned, as Chief of Staff to the Attorney General, uh, William French Smith, a Los Angelino, who uh, served with great distinction, then succeeded by Ed Meese, another just great uh, person. Uh, and I'm very close to Ed Meese. I was with him as recently as this past uh, weekend. Uh, so I guess I've run in those circles uh, by God's grace and a little bit of hard work. Uh, so uh, who knows, but the entire episode was so controversial. The entire episode, after the first two weeks. The first two weeks went great. <laughs> as I recount in the book, uh, the appointment in August of 1994 was actually praised by the New York Times. Two weeks later, the New York Times said, I think he needs to step down. <laughs> so in two weeks, I went from being whoever I was to being a very partisan Republican on a witch hunt. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we're going to get to that. Uh, oh. Uh, now, I was trying to get you off the unfair question. <laughs> I... Well, I, I also remember at the time, I, it's, you have written that while you were given the title of independent counsel, the law that established and the whole principle behind the independent counsel, I think your quote is saying it was stupid, stupid, stupid. Yeah, I... that probably wasn't the smartest remark I've ever made. But, uh, it, it was so ill-conceived. Uh, it emerged out of that Saturday night that historic Saturday night when President Nixon directed the Attorney General of the United States, Elliot Richardson, to fire Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor for Watergate. Uh, and Richardson said in a very historic meeting that didn't take very long, in the back office of, and some of you have been, and in, in, in Congressman Gallagher certainly knows what I'm talking about, in that back office of the Attorney General on the fifth floor of the Justice Department, there were Elliot Richardson, I can't do it, I'm going to have to resign. I cannot pull the trigger. Because of representations as a matter of honor that he had made promises to protect Archibald Cox's independence, I can't fire him. Bill Ruckelshaus, second in command, the Deputy Attorney General, said exactly the same thing. The third person in the room was my dear friend, future colleague, Robert Bork. Bob Bork was the Solicitor General, and in quick succession with the resignations, as a matter of law, the future Judge Bork became the acting Attorney General of the United States, and he pulled the trigger. Did he want to pull the trigger? No, uh, but uh, both uh, Elliot and Bill, the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General, setting aside 
their heavy duties said, Bob, you have made, I mean, I heard this from Bob Borg himself, Bob, you have made no promises to the Congress of the United States. You didn't have to go through that. So you can, as a matter of honor, honor the president's uh, directive. That event was so wrenching for the country that several years later, Congress passed the special prosecutor law, then called independent counsel, with the whole idea of taking the appointment outside the executive branch, investing it in the judiciary, which raised all kinds of constitutional problems. You know, the many great contributions of Ronald Reagan included the idea of a restoration of our constitutional structure, separation of powers, federalism, the, the rights of the states, and so forth. And this seemed to us in the Justice Department, in contravention when I went in the Justice Department under President Reagan in 1981, as absolutely anathema to the fundamental principles of separation of powers. Executive branch functions need to be carried on by executive branch uh, officials. We don't want the Attorney General of the United States adjudicating constitutional law cases, right? He or she might have a view, but you see the point. There was an incongruity to the appointment process. So I found myself appointed by three judges of my former court uh, to serve in this role, which again we thought was uh, anomalous in the extreme. But uh, Congress made its decision and then the Supreme Court of the United States uh, in 1987 upheld the constitutionality of that statute in a case involving a, another great Californian uh, that lives in the, the DC now, Ted Olson, who mm -hmm. was my colleague in the Justice Department uh, under Bill Smith. So the Supreme Court had spoken, and so when that call came from David Sintel, and Alice and I discussed it, uh, it was not a job that I relished, uh, but it was, in essence, a, a call to serve. Can you then now take us back 20 years, as your book does, and recite for us what essentially were the critical, the key charges uh, against the President of the United States? What were the articles of impeachment, as it were, that, that uh, eventually led to a trial in the Senate? And right, there was a transformation in the course of the investigation, but all authorized by Attorney General Janet Reno, which is another reason for writing the book. I think it was just misunderstood or just not understood by the American people that the Lewinsky phase of the investigation was specifically authorized by Janet Reno. Now, it was appointed by judges, but the mandate was determined by the Attorney General, then reviewed by the three-judge court. But the original mandate had been to examine the Whitewater land transaction and the relationship of individuals, namely James and Susan McDougall. Does this ring any bells? The co oh, this is a very learned audience. Uh, <laughs> they've studied their history. Uh, and those two individuals, James and Susan McDougall, and then two other individuals, Bill and Hillary Clinton, who were Jim and Susan's partners in the Whitewater land deal. Most relevantly, Jim and Susan McDougall on, they were the sole owners of Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan, which turned out to be a fraud-infected savings and loan institution. And the lawyer for Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan was Hillary Rodham Clinton. So we tell these stories, I mean, you see all these connections and so forth, but when I arrived in Little Rock on that very warm day in August of 1994, I really thought it was going to say in the book about a six-month investigation. But little did I suspect, and I had no reason to suspect, that there were several other active investigations going under the broad umbrella of Whitewater, uh, including, are you ready for this, violations of federal law by the 1990 uh, gubernatorial campaign of Bill Clinton. Laundering money through a bank, right? Would you have thought, well, what does that have to do with Whitewater? But my predecessor, Bob Fisk, who had been appointed by Attorney General Reno, I explained, well, it was confusing. Why was he there and so forth? So I, one of the things I try to do is to take the gentle reader through the process of the appointment and my succeeding and finding my inheritance, 
my inheritance was myriad investigations that in, implicated the sitting governor, not just the President of the United States and the First Lady, but other very important and influential uh, people in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, a rat's nest is uh, what you encountered. I know I happened, uh, uh, Judge Starr and I were talking briefly before <laughs> this event, and I, uh, in this critical period he's talking about, I happen to be uh, running a national party committee under the chairmanship of Al D'Amato, who indeed at the time chaired the banking committee, and I uh, investigating these very same issues, and I used to go into his office to talk about Senate elections, and the conversations always turned into whitewater. <laughs> so uh, I, I had the opportunity to uh, study Judge Starr's uh, movements very carefully, and, and what I always found interesting, and I've always wanted to ask you, <laughs> um, is at this remarkable moment, things turned from savings and loans and the th sorts of things you just yes. described to blue dresses. Yes. And, and, I, and I could tell from what you've said before and in the book, uh, I don't know, there's a moment of pause there, I think, on your part uh, as to, is this really where you needed to investigate, should you, uh, what was your obligation and your responsibility? Right. Can you talk about that some? And this, I think, again, and I'm so glad you're asking that question, because we had uh, a, a, a very, uh, I'm sorry to say, successful run in Arkansas. We had 14 criminal convictions, uh, the conviction of a sitting governor, uh, uh, Jim and Susan McDougall, on and on and on. It was, and so I was ready to come to Pepperdine and to uh, step into the very large shoes of a dean and now uh, vice chancellor, senior vice chancellor, uh, Ron Phillips, who's here in, in the audience. You know, I'd fallen in love with Pepperdine. I was ready to lay those burdens down. I was very eager to go into the legal academy, et cetera. So uh, then, uh, as it seems as if we're nearing the logical conclusion of our investigation, the call comes from one Linda Tripp that the President of the United States was in the process of committing perjury in the Paula Carbon Jones sexual harassment, federal civil rights case, and that uh, a young woman was encouraging her to file a perjurious affidavit in that case, just as she Monica Lewinsky had already filed such an affidavit. She said, when she was talking to my career prosecutor colleague on a Sunday night by phone, she called into the office out of the clear blue. We were working hard. So it was 9 o'clock on a Sunday night, and my colleague gets the call, takes the call, and hears the story, and he summons in our chief FBI agent who was there, two fellow prosecutors who were there, and Jack Bennett starts repeating for the benefit of now these three colleagues, and you're saying that the President of the United States is about to commit perjury, and that you're being encouraged to lie, to find, just lays it out, and everyone's eyes are big as saucers, you know, what is this? And then the bombshell, she says, you know me, I'm Linda Tripp, I was Vincent Foster's executive assistant. She was the last person in our death investigation, and we found her totally credible to see Vince Foster alive, at least in the White House complex. So we knew her in the investigation. We knew that she had provided credible, truthful information. She had a reputation for truthfulness and so forth. And that's how that process began. So when we verified by wiring Linda, and that's just a tool to, to libertarians, it sounds very offensive, but this is a typical law enforcement tool because you want credible information. You don't want someone saying, this happened, but you say, well, we need to corroborate that. We need to check this out. So when we wired Linda and then we have the ex exchange between Monica and Linda, with Monica at the Ritz-Carlton <laughs> Pentagon City saying, you need to help me with this president, and you need to file this affidavit just the way I filed this affidavit as well. So we then 
invite, we never arrested her, Monica to, would you like to come join us? We know what you're doing. You're in trouble. Let's have a conversation. And so that's how that process began. When we had that information, we then gathered that information and we informed the Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, and she says, this must be investigated. Now, in terms of your question, I wish that there had been uh, the equivalent of a National Guard unit of independent counsels. So she could say, well, I'm going to appoint Ron Phillips or James McGoldrick, one of my colleagues from Pepperdine who's here. I'm going to appoint one of them. But as a practical matter, uh, there really was no alternative for the Attorney General. So we accepted it. I wasn't lobbying for it, but I also wasn't running away from it. I wasn't being Jonah saying, no, I want to go to Pepperdine. I don't want uh, to, I want my 10 foot pole and so forth. So again, it was a sense, this is the correct thing to do. It was her judgment. This should go to Starr uh, and his colleagues in whom at that time she had great confidence. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And as you know, the way Washington painted it uh, during the time is, oh, this is something that you know, you spent your uh, last waking hours trying to find this out, and rather it's something that falls into your lap. And, and, and this was it. simply political rhetoric, and it's one of the things that I write about in the book, that we really wanted a Janet Reno to essentially ride to our rescue. Uh, we had the responsibility to carry on the investigation, but she had given us that responsibility through the special division. She applies to the court, the court says yes, this has to be investigated. The president is pursuing essentially a course of illegality. Uh, we now know what, what happened. Dick Morris, anyone remember Dick Morris's name? Ran a, a poll, an overnight poll, uh, and said the, uh, the American people will uh, forgive adultery, but they will not forgive perjury. That was the line. I know, I hear people say, well, that was then. And, <laughs> And so, and, <laughs> and so, I wish you had appointed Duke Blackwood. Duke, you would have been a great, uh, <laughs> uh, a great independent counsel. And so the upshot was that we were criticized on this very ground that he found nothing in Little Rock, what happened to the 14 criminal convictions and so forth. And therefore, he is a, a, a rogue, puritanical prosecutor. You know the narrative, I don't want to repeat it. It's unpleasant to, to, to repeat. And it was just a lie, a complete lie, because we were duly authorized by the Attorney General. Yeah. I want to ask you about a fellow that I think you might know. His name's Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> uh, can you um, tell this audience uh, how you know Brett and uh, sure. what his role was in the Whitewater investigation? To go back to 1994, before I was appointed as independent counsel, uh, I was in my law firm. I was teaching at New York University. and. Uh, things were going along very swimmingly, uh, professionally and personally. And <clears throat> so I was involved in recruiting, and Brett was coming off the clerkship with Justice Kennedy. And as I like to say, my law firm, uh, Kirkland and Ellis, won the Brett Kavanaugh Derby because <laughs> he was extremely sought after by different law firms and so forth. So he agrees to come to my law firm to work with me. And then I appointed independent counsel. So I had a, a very important uh, lunch with Brett, uh, who was just about to leave the Justice Kennedy clerkship, and I said, Brett at Cactus Cantina, great <laughs> Mexican <it>. food in <laughs> Washington, you need to come help me. I think it'll only be six months. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brett ended up working with the Vince Foster case, and he really was at my right hand. He was absolutely... Brilliant, I think everyone knows that. But here's the key in light of what the country has been through. He's a person of complete integrity. And so I believe Brett Kavanaugh. If, thank you. Uh, I will never say a disparaging word about Dr. Ford and the horror that she experienced. I don't gainsay that at all. I don't. Uh, but Brett Kavanaugh said, I didn't do it, 
And what does he have, among other things, that there is no corroboration, with all due respect to Dr. Ford, there is no corroboration. And Brett had corroboration, including his calendar from high school. There it is, the authenticity of which has not been canceled. He wasn't at the party according to the calendar. So he had to, so you, you, I don't want to relitigate that. The, the point is, uh, he had such an exemplary career, 12 years on the Court of Appeals, and I think his background is well known. I don't need to rehearse that. And throughout those 30 years of service in Washington, D.C., as a law clerk, as a, as a lawyer, as a partner in a law firm, in, in my former firm, uh, as a judge, uh, as a White House official, beyond reproach. So it seems so out of character. And so I understood his sense of righteous indignation. People can have different takes on the tone and so forth. But Brett has conducted himself as an honorable public servant for all these many decades. He's a very respected judge. Uh, again, I'm plowing old ground here. But for Elena Kagan, who uh, is a very able judge, justice now, appointed President Obama, to recruit Brett to teach at the Harvard Law School. And with that being exemplary, you know, if there are issues, they're going to pop up. But his has been an impeccable record. So uh, I was very happy that his first week of sittings, he was postponed, of course, by the hearings by a week. But the first week of sittings went swimmingly. Uh, I, my Senate committee, the Judiciary Committee, and I have a quick question on this. Having watched what occurred in the recent situation with Justice Kavanaugh, I wonder what you would think about if, this, if the committee were to establish for itself two simple rules and, uh, in the confirmation process of the next Supreme Court justice, and that is, okay, by some date certain, whether you're for or against, uh, you have evidence or you don't, by this date certain, you must um, come forth. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, anything that might have happened before you've reached the age of maturity, before the oh. age of 18, does not count. Well, the... Oh, that's going to get applause. I, I wonder yeah. if, you, if, we, if they had such rules in effect, if we yeah. might stop some of this nonsense. Well, there is uh, the idea of remoteness, stature limitations, and so forth, but, but that's to protect us as citizens uh, from criminal prosecutions. But, of course, there is no stature limitations for certain kinds of offenses. So I doubt the, the second part. But I do think the first part, here is our time frame, and lawyers are certainly accustomed, if you don't file by the appropriate time, then absent exigent circumstances, you know, uh, subsequently discovered evidence, right? That's, that sort of thing. Uh, but I think the rules were really in effect, and, and I recall vividly uh, Chairman Chuck Grassley uh, saying, where did this information come from? We know it came in in July and wasn't reported as one would expect, including it wasn't reported at an executive session where the most sensitive materials, namely the FBI files, uh, are reviewed. That would certainly have been the time to bring forward this kind of information. So uh, I th think there was procedural uh, irregularity in the way it was uh, filed, and that's really the prerogative of the chair. Are we going to consider this or not? As a political matter, I think it had to be considered. Mm -hmm. The clearer the rules in terms of engagement, the better, it's the fairer for the process. I thought that, you know, let's think about the Supreme Court of the United States as well. You know, this was something that I think was not good for the court. The process wasn't good for the court. I don't think it was good for the, for the Senate. Um, final point, uh, the wonderful Stephen Carter at the Yale Law School, after the Judge Bork debacle, uh, his confirmation hearing to become a member of the Supreme Court, wrote a very thoughtful book, The Confirmation Mess, and he had a number of suggestions for improving the confirmation process, and I think we need to dust off Stephen's book and look at his mm. ideas again. Good. Um, let's talk about uh, not the country, Russia, but the topic of Russia. 
Uh, and I bring that up in relation to the present independent counsel situation uh, versus one that um, you were so very much involved in 20 years ago. Uh, President Trump has, I don't know how many thousands of times, labeled the work of Bob Mueller and team as a witch hunt. Uh, I don't recall President Clinton or Hillary Rodham Clinton calling your work a witch hunt, but I remember the term vast right-wing conspiracy. <laughs> and I, I just wonder, is, this must be a particularly fascinating thing for you to watch as it plays itself out again, albeit very different players and different mm. matters, but uh, what's your comment on Mueller and this whole investigation? Well, I know Bob Mueller. I served uh, with him uh, under President Bush 41. He was uh, the head of the criminal division. I know him to be a man of honor. Uh, I know him to be a man of uh, integrity. I have criticized some of the people around him uh, in terms of the uh, partisanship and so forth and or the guardrails in place to make sure that the investigations uh, underway are consistent with the appearance of justice as opposed to a partisan vendetta. But uh, if I may uh, offer a friendly amendment, not only was vast right-wing conspiracy used, but witch hunt was in fact uh. used, uh, typically by the president's uh, surrogates. Uh, so <laughs> there's an old saying among defense lawyers, if you don't have the facts, then argue the law. If you don't have the art law, then start pounding on the table right, and screaming uh, and ranting. But one of the things that I think that the book reminds people of is that what I was put through in terms of, no one's above criticism. Everyone should be subject to criticism as part of accountability. But the vilification process that we experienced was straight out of uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton's uh, senior thesis at mm -hmm. Wellesley. Uh, you vilify, you demonize, you dehumanize, uh, and that was her modus operandi. Uh, and it was the modus operandi of people in the Clinton White House and, and Clinton uh, surrogates. That comes straight out of, because she wrote her senior thesis on, I recall this, uh, for the American people, we need to be reminded, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. Mm. So she went from being a Goldwater girl and Everyone goes through some sort of transformation and so forth, or change. But there was a pretty significant transformation to go from being a Goldwater girl outside Chicago to becoming a disciple of Saul Alinsky and Rules for Radicals, disrupting her own graduation by attacking a very distinguished uh, United States Senator from Massachusetts, an African-American gentleman named Edward Brooke. She stands up and attacks him from the podium. Well, that's straight out of Saul Alinsky. So attack, attack, attack. So I disapprove of those kinds of tactics, regardless of who the president is. I think they uh, erode respect for the rule of law. But interestingly enough, the Trump presidency is running on two tracks vis-a-vis -vis the investigation. There's the vilification, which I completely disapprove of. But on the other hand, there's the track of what appears to be complete cooperation. There's been no litigation about access to documents and so forth, apparently no invocations of executive privilege. We were confronted with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to litigate these issues. We had to litigate, and one of the stories I tell is, when I heard that the President of the United States had suggested that Secret Service agents were immune from testifying because of the protective function privilege, I said, what's that? And they said, it doesn't exist. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And sure enough, not a single judge along the way, but we had to litigate it, said that there's anything to, it was totally made up, totally contrived, the protective function privilege. Never had been argued in a court of law, but President Clinton did it, right? Mm -hmm. And the American people are very forgiving. They finally said, look, we do, we do not want, with all due respect, to the House of Representatives. We do not want to remove the, the, the president. And by the way, one of the things, I don't want to jump ahead, but I do want to say this lest we run out of time, and that is, this is also a cautionary tale 
be careful if you're asking for impeachment because the founding generation determined that the people's house should in fact act by majority vote. Now 31 Democrats supported one or more articles of impeachment so it was not just on a party line. But as it moved across Capitol Hill to the United States Senate, then no Democrats supported and, and the country turned against impeachment. What the founding generation was telling us is you need a national consensus, a two-thirds majority. So I hope that this message will be taken to heart as we look ahead to the midterms. Who knows what's going to happen? But obviously there are all these cries, impeach the president. The first thing we'll do if we have power is to impeach the president. And I think it's a profound, this isn't politics, this is about our constitutional order. It is a profound disservice to the American people to be yelling impeachment when you know you don't have a supermajority. <laughs> Uh, to that point, this will be my last question, and I'd like to turn it to the audience for a few minutes. Um, there was a star report. I remember I bought it. I went to the store, I bought it. I got no royalties. <laughs> <laughs> the Children's Education Fund was not supported by um, that. Whether we lead down that path you just described, that ugly situation of potential impeachment of the president. Um, do you envision the, the, the Mueller investigation is likely, whether we like it or not, there will be something called the Mueller report that I go buy at a store and that goes to the Congress for such a decision? Uh, watch me be proven wrong. I am frequently wrong. But when I read the regulations under which the special counsel, Bob Mueller, was appointed, I don't see that. In contrast, the law under which we were operating, uh, Congressman, actually called for a report to the House of Representatives. And it, in fact, the law looked toward impeachment. It created, I call it an engine, a pro-impeachment engine, which has since been tossed. Section 595C, welcome to law school, of the, <laughs> of the statute, the independent counsel statute specifically required the independent counsel to refer to the House of Representatives when there is substantial and credible information that an impeachable offense may have been committed. And so do you see why Antonin Scalia in his mighty dissent in the case that upheld the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute said this is unconstitutional and this is all about power. Congress versus the presidency. It's why President Clinton's on White House counsel, Bernie Nussbaum, a tough uh, New York uh, lawyer who ended up being fired, not in connection with this per se, but urged President Clinton not to sign this law into uh, action. And he said, "This, Mr. President, this is a dagger aim, aimed by Congress at the heart of the President of the United States. Now, why is that? because it looked toward impeachment. The regulations don't do that. In fact, the regulations could be complied with with a very minimalist report just saying, here's who we prosecuted, here are the results of that, here's who we didn't prosecute, here are the basic reasons. I think there's discretion built in so that the Justice Department's senior officials, especially Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, could in fact say, the public needs to know everything, so do a full report. Okay. With that, we've got about uh, 12, 13 minutes for questions that you all might have. And if you do have a question, if you could raise your hand. We have uh, wonderful staff that have microphones in their hand, and we'll start with uh, this gentleman right over here. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, it's so interesting. What do you think happened to Vince Foster? Uh, <laughs> from the applause, this may be a minority of one, but uh, I am convinced beyond any doubt, even beyond a reasonable doubt, that he took his own life at Fort Marcy Park. Uh, he was clinically de de depressed. Uh, so all this is laid out in a report 
primarily authored by Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> uh, there it is. These good people keep walking across the stage. I think the critical person, critical, critical question is why did he take his life? Yes. Yes. And I believe that it's a theory, but I lay out the theory that he may very well have been involved in an obstruction of justice by removing the Rose Law Firm billing records mm. or participating in their removal clandestinely. The Rose Law Firm said this was an act of theft. These were Hillary's billing records, and those billing records then reappeared where? The White House in the what room? <laughs> The book room where the First Lady was writing It Takes a Village. Now we call that circumstantial evidence. <laughs> and on the billing records when they were finally turned over, they'd been under subpoena for at least two years. What is on the billing records? You say, well, didn't they have an electronic back? Friends, this is early 1990s. There were no backup documents. On the billing records was the handwriting that we determined conclusively was that of Vincent Foster Jr. with red lines pointing to especially interesting legal services that Hillary had rendered for Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. So that is to me the real question. Why? It was assumed and widely discussed that he was depressed because of the travel office firings, I describe all that. That was referred to us by Attorney General Reno to look into, were there crimes committed? We determined there were no crimes committed, but it was an abuse of power. An abuse of power by, really, Hillary. And Vince was the hatchet man, and he didn't want to fire those good people. They were good, honorable people, seven career uh, civil servants who handled travel uh, arrangements. Uh, but uh, Hillary's view was get rid of these people and to bring in a friend from Arkansas to run the operation, et cetera. And from the testimony we were able to get, Vince did not like that, but he knew he had to obey the order. And so that has loomed large, I think. It loomed large at the time in the public consciousness of what was on Vince's mind. But I think people have overlooked, and I try to shed light on this, look at the Rose Law Firm billing records under subpoena, no crime, White House travel office firings, just an abuse of power, that's politics. But what about defying a subpoena, stealing them from the law firm and bringing them to Washington, D.C., where they would be safe? Mm. Mr. St Mr. Starr, um, I have a two-part question. I, I was a little startled by you seemingly indicating that because Republicans didn't have a supermajority back in the Clinton affair, that they apparently should not have impeached Bill Clinton. That's my first question, because that's what it sounds like you're saying, if, because there was no supermajority, that that would somehow block impeachment. And in relation to that, I would like you to compare. Can I, can I answer that sure. very briefly? Because I believe it's a factor counseling restraint because calls for impeachment without the most serious kinds of grounds. I think what the Clinton process tells us is the country intuitively does not like impeachment. So it's a, it's a factor that should be taken into account in the political process. No, no, I've never criticized the House of Representatives for its judgment. I respect that judgment greatly. I have said, including in the book, I wish there had been, in retrospect, a more robust debate with respect to a lesser sanction called a resolution of censure being pushed by, have you heard of Senator Dianne Feinstein? <laughs> and have you heard of Senator Joe Lieberman? But uh, there was a sense, and, and I understand this, I respect the view, that it's impeachment or nothing. Uh, I respectfully and strongly disagree with that view, that in the discretion of the House of Representatives, the House of Representatives could have said, we're going to have a resolution of censure. Ditto for the Senate. I'm sorry, well, question two. Thank you, you make me feel much better about that. <laughs> um, but here's my real question. So I, I agreed with you back in 1998-99 that the conversation that Bill Clinton had with Betty Curry the morning yes. after uh, the Monica Lewinsky uh, testimony where he perjured himself and then 
he suborns her perjury in the White House the next day. I believe that was an impeachable offense. But I've heard you, and I could be wrong, please correct me if I am, I know you will. I've, I've heard you've been somewhat dismissive of the conversation Donald Trump had with James Comey that I find to be far more egregious, where he says, you're gonna go easy uh, on Flynn, and I need your loyalty, and then he fires him. I wonder if you could compare those two episodes, the Betty Curry conversation, which you said was sure. impeachable, and the Comey situation. Because Betty, first of all, uh, President Clinton was defying an order from Susan Weber Wright in a court of law. So let's, let's leave politics aside and the executive power, the exercise of executive power. My view is, and you might disagree with this, uh, but it's a free country. Uh, the president could fire Jim Comey for any reason he wants to, period. Uh, uh, unless, unless there is a corrupt bargain, a, a, a payment of, of, of a bribe or something like that. But the president exercising power for his own self-interest, his political self-interest and so forth, is simply that which we consider in the, in the polity and whether we think well of the president or think ill of the president, but it's not a crime. And I think that conversation has virtually ended in terms of somehow the firing of James Comey, his interest in bringing the Russian investigation to an end and so forth, was somehow obstruction of justice. It's simply not. I even convinced Chris Cuomo. Do you know who Chris Cuomo is? And I didn't convince him, the Supreme Court did, and it's a unanimous decision, Arthur Anderson versus the United States. So anyway, uh, what President Clinton did was not only defy a specific order, but he also was encouraging her to lie under oath. We're, not ta we're talking politics and power with President Trump. With President Clinton, we're talking contempt for the rule of law. He said, well, that's awfully harsh. No, he was found in contempt, and thus the name of the book, by a United States District Court judge, and Bill Clinton is the only president, in, thankfully, in our history, the entire history of the republic, to have been found in contempt by a federal district court. And he did not appeal. He didn't move for reconsideration. He simply accepted the contempt judgment. That strikes me as totally different in terms of values of the rule of law. Right, um, right here. Thank you for being here. That's all. Oh, thank you very much for being here. It's been really great. So. Thank you. Hillary Clinton was Madison guarantee? She's a lawyer. Lawyer, okay. So she, I'm just trying to go through the process of this all the way up to her 33,000 missing emails. <laughs> how, how does this woman escape prison? Uh, how, how, does, how does this happen? <laughs> <And> <laughs> And one of the stories that I tell in the book, which I felt was very important for the public domain, and it's just, it's fact. This is not opinion. We sat in our office with a draft indictment of Hillary Rodham Clinton, a very significant prosecution memo, we call it in the trade, a pros memo. And we had a thorough discussion. And at the end of the day, we unanimously concluded that we simply did not have admissible evidence to prove all the elements of the offense is beyond a reasonable doubt. That is the comfort that all Americans should have, that the ethical prosecutor, and I tried to be, and I'm confident that we were ethical prosecutors, do not bring charges unless they can prove those charges in a court of law. So she skated. Why did she skate? The lack of admissible evidence, as they say, documentary evidence, and one of the chapters has to do, it has a whimsical side and it has a very dark and, and evil side. Document destruction of Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. So there are a lot of missing documents. And then a whimsical, a tornado comes through, literally the act of God, and all of a sudden records from Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan show up in the trunk of an abandoned car. <laughs> and one, read it here, and one, <laughs> 
And one of the documents that was found by uh, the insurance inspector looking at the damage at this auto repair place, but the car had been abandoned, was a check, $5,000, signed by Susan McDougall, and the, the ray line was, pay off Clinton. Now, we couldn't get Susan McDougall to cooperate. Remember, she went into criminal contempt. I also tell the story, because we were told this by Jim McDougall, that President Clinton essentially sent the signal that he would take care of her. And on his last full day in office, he granted her a presidential pardon. We have time for, I'm sorry, just one last question, Judge, and I will just go right up here to this patient fellow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, when I was teaching at Pepperdine, I used to tell my students that it was uncertain whether a president could be prosecuted, but that certainly a president can issue pardons, as uh, President Clinton did pardon his brother, his business partner, contributors. Was it a consideration that he would pardon his wife on why Mrs. Clinton was not indicted? And I missed what the question was. Yeah. The I, question. I, did, I did as well. Was there a question in that? Yes. Was it a consideration that the president would give a pardon to the first lady, and that's the reason she was not indicted? Oh, uh, no. Uh, that's a very creative thought, though. <laughs> They're very creative and clever at, at, at Pepperdine, but the, 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 the the short answer is no, but I do want to use this uh, sort of closing comment. Uh, and I'm not in a total minority, but I'm certainly in a distinct minority. I guess that there's no such thing as a total minority, but everyone in the minority. I, I believe a sitting president can be indicted. Uh, one person agrees with me. Yeah, so. Doesn't mean that the president of the United States should be indicted. Uh, and there certainly is an argument based uh, on the structure of the Constitution, supported by Hamilton's Federalist 69, that there should be impeachment before the president has to face anything else. However, uh, here's my problem with that. The president cannot be, under our system, above the rule of law. So imagine this hypothetical, I'll make this very, very, very brief, that a hypothetical president, seems as if presidents like to play golf, right? So the hypothetical president goes to a hypothetical, it sounds like law school, goes to a hypothetical golf club, and in a fit of rage, because his caddy is making some kind of smarmy comment about the president's inability to hit, you know, the, to, to drive, uh, the, anyway, you get the idea. You know, in a fit of rage and fury, he said, I told you to shut up, boom, and clubs him with a five iron, okay? The caddy is, you know, survives happily, is taken to the hospital, and says, okay, uh, I guess my caddying days for the president are over, but I'm going to show him, and files a lawsuit, civil lawsuit. Under the Supreme Court's decision in Clinton versus Jones, Jones, Nine to nothing, the president can be sued. Okay? Now the district attorney says, this is so outrageous, the president of the United States is not going to get through this, and goes to the local grand jury to file a criminal complaint. The president then says, oh, well, I've got to answer the caddy over here and write him a check, but I do not have to face we the people. To me, there is no logic. To that. If anything, the force and power, the public policy informing the criminal laws is higher than, as important as it is, the interests of a single individual in achieving a just result through our civil justice system. So there you have my argument. But by the way, oh, I get one more applause. <laughs> but this is moot because Justice Department policy under both uh, the Clinton administration, I mean, going back in time to Bob Bork's famous memorandum where he drew a distinction between indicting Spiro Agnew, that he can be indicted. Now, th that was all worked out, the resignation of the vice president and so forth, very sad, but that the president cannot be indicted. 
So I have the greatest respect and I venerate the memory of Robert Bork, but I just respectfully disagree with it. But that is the official position of the Justice Department, which, the relevant point, binds Bob Mueller. So this Justice Department will not, regardless, or this special counsel, will not indict Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, on, on that note, uh, <laughs> Judge Starr, I just want to say what an honor it is uh, for all of us to be here with you and to have a Pepperdine Law School class like this. Um, it's just been just terrific. So thank you so much for coming on behalf thank of you. Me. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. You was great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated while our VIP guests exit the building. Once those guests have left the building, please make your way to the doors to your left. Thank you for joining us tonight.